Hi there. My name is Christina Hermansen and I work as Head of Exhibitions here at Telemark Museum Norway. As you can see from my surroundings, Telemark Museum is a very typical, traditional and regional museum. Actually, we're so traditional that when we checked our visitors numbers last time, they hadn't changed for a hundred years. Obviously, that was not the result we wanted, so we started looking for a method of interpretation that could engage the groups that seemingly hadn't visited us for a hundred years. And by being brave, we found it. The term immersive experience is usually linked to technology and the creation of completely virtual environments. You'll often then need VR goggles or some other equipment in order to take part in it. But immersive experiences can also be constructed in other ways. The important part is that you create an illusory environment that completely surrounds you so that you feel inside it and taking part in it. When visitors then come to take part, they go from being spectators to becoming real participants. And that's when the real magic starts. For museums and cultural heritage sites that would like to create an immersive experience, you'll need to remember that we are often nearly halfway there because we are true experts in creating illusory environments and using scenography. At Telemark Museum, we have paired one of our whew, quite large illusory environments, one of our exhibitions, and we've paired that with escape room. That is a concept of learning and gaming that hmm, you get locked in actually and you have 60 minutes to escape the room again through solving puzzles, finding passwords and hidden equipment and then utilising it. If you'd like to tag along, I'll show you how we've done it. When we decided to make an escape room in these surroundings, we had uh, two main concerns. The first one was actually that we were a bit afraid that our museum colleagues would frown at us for coming up with such a strange idea. But they didn't. And the second concern we had was a bit more serious because we were afraid that the new use of these rooms would possibly harm our collections. We realised that we needed some kind of help, so we contacted the Escape Games in Oslo. When they first arrived, they didn't help on the nervousness about the collections at all, because when they came in here, they were overexcited at the prospect of making an escape room in these surroundings. Having talked things through, no drilling, no extra things to be installed, etc. The escape games turn out to be a great help for us. They taught us about you need a storyline, you need wow moments in an escape room, you need to have a script and you need to test everything a thousand times. What was also great about the escape games uh, is that they actually, they both develop and run their own escape rooms. And so we could order our own bespoke installations from them. The escape room uh, that we made here has a theme that suits the surroundings. This house was owned by a man uh, named Nils Aul and in 1814, at the end of the Napoleonic Wars, he was a really important man. And this is the intro that we present to our visitors when they enter the escape room. The Napoleonic Wars have been ravaging Europe for years. Denmark-Norway tried to keep a neutral stance in this war between the great powers, but eventually we were unwillingly drawn into the conflict on the side of Napoleon and his French Empire. This had dire consequences for Norway. 
the English enforced a blockade of the Norwegian coast so that the needed grain couldn't be imported, and as a consequence, famine ensued. Sweden, victors in the Napoleonic Wars, now stand poised to take Norway as their prize. They will discard the constitution and destroy all hopes of independence if peace cannot be found. Nils Ål now needs help from the society to seal the peace agreement with the Swedes. Representatives have been sent to Sheen to collect Ål's personal signet ring. This ring is hidden and locked away securely. This is a time of Swedish spies, closed store meetings and secret accords, so knowing who to trust is difficult. The representatives of the society will have to show themselves worthy of the assignment and prove that they are among those that have only Norway's best interests at heart. The estate of Southern Brekke is a residence full of hidden secrets, mysteries and codes. Orl is not the type of man to leave his signet ring around for anyone to find. It is most likely hidden away well, and only truly worthy members of the society will have what it takes to find it, and thus secure Norway's constitution. The last courier to Moss leaves in exactly 60 minutes, so do not delay, or the full might of the Swedish war machine will be released upon us, and we will descend back into chaos. The clock is ticking. So, when the visitors wants to enter the museum or the escape room, they are first handed a very simple note. And this is to show you how extremely easy and simple escape room tasks can be made. They need then to figure out what to do with this note. And obviously it is a code and there's a doorknob. So let's see what happens when we go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, one, two, three, four. Aha! The door opens. And you're then being met by one of our guides. Because as these are our real museum interiors, we didn't want to leave the visitors all on their own in the collections. And we solved that then by having one of our guides dressing up, following the visitors around, and then combining the tasks of providing hints when needed to the visitors, but also looking after the collections. Hang along and we'll show you some more. Now we're at the dinner table. And if you look at these plates, we have marked them with a symbol that we simply just made up ourselves to tell the visitors that it's all right to touch these objects. When you flip it over, some of them will have a uh, symbol on the back as well. You'll need to remember the symbol and the number indicated. And by the way, these are modern Wedgwood plates, so we have bought them as replicas. So if any one of them should break, it can be replaced. But none of them have broken so far and we have been open since 2018 now. When you have found all the symbols with their corresponding numbers, you need to look at these gears. On the gears, you'll find symbols and numbers. The visitors then bring these gears over to this box and put them here and by aligning them, symbol and number, you'll end up with a code that you can enter here on the padlock. Then the padlock opens and the box opens. Inside the box 
you'll then find another set of gears. And by looking around a little bit, you'll see a clock over here where these gears seem to fit. So we'll open the door. And this is one of the bespoke uh, installations that we had from Escape Games, by the way. Enter the gears at the right place. Let's see. Now a drawer just opened and inside the drawer you'll find objects that you need to bring along to the next level of the game. Uh, we'll show you some more example of the tasks that we have constructed for our escape room. Obviously the purpose of building an escape room for a museum is to engage the visitors in the story that we want to convey to them. And we are doing that by, here we are providing um, some documents that tell people about the diplomatic struggle that went on in 1814 when Norway wanted to be independent. And by following these instructions in the documents, um, you can use this, which has a magnet. You'll, oops, pick up a key and you can bring it home to Norway again. <laughs> Another task here that is quite easy to build yourself. Here we've used a tabletop and a desk drawer and the replica of one of our own paintings is this one. This is a labyrinth that when you finish it you get hold of another key and you get more clues to solve the game. As you can see, all of these things are mechanical and they needed to be, as the theme is 1814. But this escape room turned out to be quite successful for us. And then we got a bit cocky. We thought, let's build another escape room and let's do it high tech this time. So now we had a change of scenery. The house beside me was the childhood home of Henrik Ibsen, the world famous playwright and author of titles like A Doll's House, Ghosts and An Enemy of the People. And trying to provide physical interpretation and exhibitions of literature, which is immaterial by nature, quite difficult. Here in Norway, 15 and 16 years old, they often have the play Per Gunt on their curriculum. And since we felt that such experts having made the first escape room, we thought that we might build another one and target them for this immersive experience. And luckily for us, we have this big empty barn here that was built after the Ibsen family left the farm. We contacted someone to help build our second escape room too, but this time it was our cultural colleagues in the regional theatre company Theatre Ibsen and the regional administration. The regional administration provided us with most of the funding necessary and then the project started. We had already cooperated with the theatre on a variety of different projects, so we knew each other to some extent. But what we at the museum did not really know about the theatre was the amount of technical know-how that a theatre has when it comes to solving nearly all aspects of making an escape room. The theatre even provided the project with its own theatre painter, and they are rare in Norway, but the quality of the scenography was an absolute for the theatre in the process. The theatre was as brave as us and brought solutions, implementation capacity and fantastic scenography to the project. All the programming of sound, lights and effects was done locally by the theatre or their associates. And for our guides, 
who runs the escape room on a daily basis, it comes down to a simple on-off button. The actual building of the two-storey high escape room was mostly done by the museum's own preservation departments. The idea of the Per Gint escape room is to let the visitors try to save Per's self-centred soul by bringing his beating heart home. In order to do so, you will game through some of the scenes of the play. In Egypt, you need to recognise cartouches and hieroglyphs on a large sarcophagus to find more clues that takes you through the play. In the Norwegian woodlands of Per Gint's farm, you will hear birds tweet and find secret items hidden in the trees and on the ground. You need to count them well, because this will give you the code for going on. In the Hall of the Mountain King, you feel quite locked up and cooperation is absolutely necessary if you want to find the exit. These two immersive experiences took bravery to carry out on our part, but they have brought us so much joy and moments of pure happiness when people who do not normally visit museums have come out of the game and expressed their desire to know more about 1814 or to revisit Per Gint. The method is really working magic from a museum worker's point of view. On the statistical side, both our visitors' numbers and our revenue has gone up after implementing the escape rooms in our office. And last September we were able to let more than a thousand young students participate as part of our schooling activities. Now we have seen that it's not impossible for a pretty average and traditional regional museum with a total staff of only 40 to be brave and go immersive. And none of us had any experience in constructing escape rooms in advance. For us, the struggle was very well worth it. We are very happy with the results. So now we dare you Will you be brave and go immersive? If you'd like any advice from us at Taylor Mike Museum, you are of course very, very welcome to contact us. Thanks for watching. Bye.